Welcome to Brain Info Live for everyone in the brain health community. Brain Info Live is about hope, health, support, education, and you. Whether you're living with Alzheimer's or a caregiver, family member, or loved one of someone who is, Brain Info Live is here for everybody. Good morning, good day, everyone. My name is Barbara Chandler, and you have just tuned in to Brain Info Live. And I did say live. This is our 12th session, and we will be discussing the relationship between dementia and diabetes. For those of us who are in Florida right now, we are hoping that everyone is safe and prepared. We do realize that Hurricane Ian is upon us. And we just wanted to make sure that we were also being consistent in bringing you information. But the first priority is that you and your family and your loved ones, that they are safe. So we are keeping that in consideration. We have a very special guest, of course, with you joining us today. She is the friend of Brain Info Live. It is Dr. Naushira Pandia, and she's going to be discussing, again, the correlation between dementia and diabetes. But of course, first, and you know by now, we take care of business around here, and that business is with none other than John Lewis better known as J. Lou, our fitness guru. He's going to do our five-minute chair exercise. And as we always say, go at your own pace. Okay, this is not a competition. This is for you. Make this five minutes work in your best advantage. We want you to stay healthy. We want you to be active. But most of all, we want you to be safe. So up next is J. Lou, our fitness guru. Hey, I'm J. Lou, your fitness guru. I want to welcome everyone to Brain Info Live. Today, we're about to go preserve cosmic style. So in five seconds, get your dumbbells, a comfortable chair, and let's go. Five, four, three, two, and one. Let's go.
your fitness guru, and see you later. Bye. All righty, so that was Jay Lou, the fitness guru. And as always, we hope you made the best out of that five minutes. The music was so enjoyable. Um, what a great, intense upper body workout, a lot of arms. And we're always using those upper body parts to move things. So why not keep them fit? Keep it nice and tight. Once again, my name is Barbara Chandler, and you are listening and watching Brain Info Live. I am here in Florida. Normally, I would say sunny Florida, but right now we are in preparation. We are hunkered down um, as the hurricane is upon us. And Brain Info Live team wants everyone to be safe. We want you to be um, want you to be prepared, of course, with all the necessary supplies and items that you need to get through these next couple um, these next couple days. Pardon me, today and tomorrow. This particular topic uh, today is about dementia and diabetes. Uh, we have, of course, with us Dr. Pandia. And she is going to be discussing the relationships of those two. But right now, as usual, it is time to go to the movies. We're going to do our movie segment. And this is from UCLA. The, it's about the lack of eating and how caregivers can manage meals for older adults. Okay. So this particular uh, segment, what you're going to see, video segment, what you're going to see, it is about the lack of eating and how caregivers can manage meals for older adults. Tell me about your father's eating problem. Food was always important to my father. He was an extremely successful businessman, but he was always home for dinner, except when he was traveling. I, I remember him coming home and my mother would always have a big meal waiting for him, beginning with a scotch and appetizers. Dinner would last hours until I needed to do my homework and go to bed. He was so happy, his family beside him in a big supper. As his Alzheimer's disease progressed, Dad became less interested in eating and began losing weight. I could still get him to drink scotch and wine when we sat down for dinner, but he wouldn't touch his meal other than a few bites and only when we prompted him. What did you do to try to help him? As he began to lose weight, I asked his doctor about appetite stimulants, and he said there weren't any that are safe and have been proven effective for persons with dementia. So I asked about medical marijuana, and although he said there is some evidence for it stimulating appetite in AIDS patients, it hasn't been studied in persons with dementia. He said if we wanted to try it, that he was willing to write a prescription. <laughs> I had to laugh because dad was so anti-drug when we were growing up, and now we were gonna be getting him high. So we tried it, but unfortunately it didn't work. Did the doctor have any other suggestions? He looked at my father's medications and stopped one or two that might contribute to decreased appetite. That didn't help either. Finally, we talked about dad's diet. First, the doctor had us taper his alcohol, substituting alcohol-free wine and beer. The doctor also said that because of his Alzheimer's, the benefit of a low cholesterol diet wouldn't be much. He also said dad's diabetes wasn't that severe and new guidelines allow for his blood sugars to run a bit higher. So we allowed him to eat foods he likes more. Now that helped a lot. <laughs> he really took to gelato. And it's funny, once he began to eat, he started eating more like he remembered that he's supposed to eat. Was there anything else you did? The doctor also suggested that we take ownership of his eating and not rely on dad to take the initiative. It was basically providing closer supervision to make sure his meal was set up and he knew he was supposed to be eating. Sometimes we needed to remind him every few minutes to take a bite of food. And the doctor also advised us not to force him to clean the plate every meal. Rather, he said, give him between meal snacks. We began with supplements from the store, but found milkshakes worked just as well, especially if we mixed a banana in. Dad began to gain weight and we don't need to give him the snacks anymore, except of course on special occasions. Is there anything that you would have done different? We probably would have mentioned the problem to his doctor earlier and not waited until he was losing weight. Do you have any advice for others? 
Although the getting food and dad crisis is over, his eating's not back to usual. Instead, it's a new normal that we needed to adjust to. You know, meal times aren't the same, but things are definitely better, and I worry a lot less about his eating. Hi there, welcome back everyone. That was a great segment. And here with us is Dr. Pandia. Dr. Nushura Pandia is a professor and chair of the geriatrics department at NSU Karen C. Patel College of Osteopath Osteopathic, am I saying that correctly? Medicine and the project director I'm sorry, again? Osteopathic. Osteopathic, thank you. Osteopathic Medicine and the Project Director of the HRSA-funded NSU South Florida, Florida Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program. She is board certified in internal medicine, geriatrics, and endoc endocrinology and metabolism and is a certified medical doctor for nursing homes. Dr. Pandia is a past president of AMDA, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. She's participated and led, she's participated and led in the development of multiple clinical guidelines and position statements and is, a recon and is recognized for her work in the area of diabetes in the elderly. Dr. Pandia holds the distinction of being a Fulbright Senior Specialist Scholar. She is a great friend to Brain Info Live. This is the second time she's with us, so we definitely want to give you a very warm welcome. Thank you so very much for being here with us. Thank you, Barbara. It's a great pleasure to be here again. And thank absolutely, you for inviting me. Absolutely. That was um, a very interesting um, video for so many reasons um, in watching it. And I'm sure you're going to help us to digest this uh, because we're not thinking of um, Alzheimer's, eating habits, um, and the links to diabetes. So um tell us explain to us exactly what we just saw yeah that was i really enjoyed watching that video too and this is such a common problem and we see this in our clinics and in our nursing home population um as people develop uh, alzheimer's or other forms of dementia the appetite is suppressed and interest in food enjoyment concentration with a you know set meal uh, suffers and weight loss is very common and that can be detrimental because you're more prone to infections, you lose muscle, your immune system declines, you're more prone to falling. So what was illustrated there was liberalizing the diet and looking at factors that could impair the appetite. And some medications do that and the doctor approached that. Uh, also, the family was, you know, very careful about low cholesterol and low fat diets, as we do when we're in, you know, young and middle age. Uh, but what we do know is in older adults, diet should not be restricted. And even food consistency, softer, easier food, food with more sauces, more taste uh, is beneficial. And older people with diabetes should have what I call a real food diet. They should just eat real food that they like. And uh, wow. as the gentleman mentioned, the, our professional guidelines do recommend less tighter blood glucose control for older people with diabetes because the research has shown that very tight control that you would use in younger adults is not beneficial. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow, that was interesting. So we got a few questions here. Uh, the first one says, when we say diabetes and dementia, is it type one and two or just one of the types? Uh, that's a, So the most common type of diabetes in this country is type two diabetes, which is associated with overweight, uh, genetic tendencies, 
uh, lifestyle, eventually those patients may need insulin. Okay, but it's not our first line. And type 1 patients need insulin right from the beginning. They're dependent on insulin for treatment. But actually, both types of diabetes are associated with dementia or some form of cognitive impairment. And now don't forget, uh, Barbara, patients with type 1 diabetes are also living longer. They're living into the you know Medicare age group and older. Whereas we didn't oh, see that. Wow. That's really good to know. That's really good. Yeah. One of the things in the uh, video that stuck out to me is when uh, the son stated that he took his father to the doctor and they tried the prescription marijuana. Was it to yeah. have him to, to smoke it and see that would he get um, cravings? Was that the reason for that? I think overall that was it. Um, and to see if his appetite would increase because what his father had was anorexia, you know, loss of appetite and interest in food and many conditions in older people and younger people, you know, can cause that. Um, and certainly in cancer patients, we use uh, a, prep a medication called Marinol, which is derived from marijuana to stimulate appetite, to reduce nausea, and it kind of generally improves the well-being of cancer patients. And as you rightly said, you know, the doctor was willing to try it in this patient. It's not officially approved, but certainly, okay. you know, with discussion and appropriate documentation, this can be done. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about hypoglycemia insulin and the role they both play when we're speaking about dementia? Yes. Um, so let me just first explain hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. So this is the terminology for low blood sugar. And generally blood sugars lower than 70 milligrams per deciliter are considered hypoglycemia. Uh, more significant hypoglycemia is less than 54 milligrams. And then there's this condition called severe hypoglycemia, which can be any level of blood sugar where the patient cannot get themselves out of trouble. They, they need to, uh, you know, they need help from an outside person. They can't reach out for the juice or, you know, eat the candy in their bag or ask for help. Uh, they deteriorate very quickly mentally and physically. So it takes an observer to help them out. So that's severe hypoglycemia. Uh -huh. Now, hypoglycemia can occur with all forms of diabetes treatment. People who are on insulin and certain diabetes medications in that group called sulfonylureas, uh, they can increase the risk of hypoglycemia more. That's not to say these are bad drugs. I mean, you need medication to get your blood glucose down, right, when it's very elevated in, in people with diabetes. But you have to watch how low is the blood sugar going. And if it's too low all the time, and patients may not be aware, they may not have those symptoms of sweating, you know, fear, uh, this gnawing hunger, a tremor uh, that alerts them that their blood sugar is low. So over-treatment is still common in older people. We tend to get the blood sugars too low at times. And that can be detrimental mm -hmm. to brain function. And repeated episodes of hypoglycemia have been shown to be associated with impaired you know, brain function and cognition. Increased incidence right. of dementia. We have repeated episodes of hypoglycemia. Wow. Wow. I, I you know what I'm 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 thinking of the caregiver in this instance. I'm thinking of the caregiver, the day-to-day. Um, caring of the person living with dementia, and now they also have to watch for all of these other things in which we're yeah. speaking about. So we definitely want to give a shout out to the caregivers. This is never an easy role. I mean, it's one thing um, dealing with the diagnosis of dementia, but then when you start to add on these other complexities, that uh, caring definitely takes on a different form each time. 
Yes, caregivers play a huge role, not only in the care of dementia patients, but managing all these comorbid illnesses and the medications, the complexity, the devices, the administration of these medications, yeah. not to mention the medical follow-up. I mean, caregivers really need um, our gratitude and uh, a lot of mm -hmm. kudos because they provide the majority of caregiving is provided by unpaid family or other caregivers in this country. Okay. I'm sorry, someone's coming in. I don't want them to disturb us. Um, the next question says, should people, I'm sorry, the next one says, other than high blood sugar, what are some other diabetes factors that affect dementia? Yes, yeah, so, you know, diabetes doesn't just come as a single problem, unfortunately. So it's not just a high mm -hmm. glucose problem. I often say, and certainly my experience has borne that out, that people with diabetes have a head-to-toe disease. There's almost nothing mm. that diabetes does not affect in the body. And so people with diabetes are more likely to have hypertension. They're more likely to have high cholesterol uh, levels and some related to poor control, but sometimes it just goes with the territory. And so they're more likely to have cardiovascular disease, hardening of the arteries affecting the brain, strokes, mini strokes, TIAs, um, heart attacks, you know, circulatory problems in the legs, kidney failure. So all that is due to cardiovascular problems and the poorly controlled diabetes in general. Wow. Hmm. And I guess that goes to the next question should people go on very healthy diets to combat these things? Yeah, so the first thing I want to say is um, that this is not a blame situation, okay? Uh, when okay. you have a diagnosis of diabetes, it's not your fault, okay? But you have some predisposition. You may It may be in your family. It may be related to weight or your activity, but... So some of that can be improved. Lifestyle can improve and reduce blood glucose levels. And if you're in the very early stages of diabetes, such as pre-diabetes, uh, lifestyle changes and weight loss could actually bring you back into the normal range of blood glucose levels. Uh, so while diet, exercise, change of you know uh, lifestyle can help, uh, sometimes the type 2 diabetes is, is a progressive disease. And over mm. time, the pancreas is able to produce less and less insulin. So I tell patients that, you know, over time, you will need more treatment. We can slow this down by controlling your diet, especially the carbohydrates in your diet, by doing at least, you know, 30 minutes of exercise five days a week, which is the general recommendation including a couple of times of weight-based exercises, that can help. A Mediterranean diet could help as well, and that has been shown to improve uh, cognition in dementia patients. Okay. And actually reduces the risk of dementia, a Mediterranean diet. All that helps. Good control of blood pressure is essential, especially in midlife. Even when you don't think you're doing that badly, you need to control your blood pressure and also keep an eye on your cholesterol levels. There are plenty of good treatments for that in addition to diet. Correct. Correct. Wow. And thank you for, for stating that um, it's not a blame, no blame, no shame no. is what we always say. No. Um, a, a lot of these things we do inherit um, genetically. So it's, it's good to hear that because I think a lot of people um, may think that they have done something wrong, um, their mm -hmm. weight, their eating habits. So thank you so much for saying that. And once again, you know, in just about every every uh, segment that we've done, the, the consistent um, theme has been nutrition and exercise. Those are things mm -hmm. that can, as you say, um, kind of bring you into balance. Um, we don't want to say that those are the cure-alls, but those are definitely no. things that can slow down the progression. 
So that's been very consistent. I think the only time it may not have been stated is during the driving one, but otherwise than that. Um, we have another question here. This is actually coming from the audience. It says smoothies are very recommend. Are smoothies recommended for dementia patients? Should other foods be given be simple to ingest? I hope I'm reading this correctly. I, I think I get the gist of that. Um, yes, yeah, smoothies okay. are good. Uh, you know, people who don't eat well and patients with dementia and even as you get older, I mean, think about it. If you think about your grandparents or your parents, can they finish a big meal like you can over Thanksgiving or Christmas? They can't. You know, they won't finish all three courses necessarily. Um, so appetite goes down as you get older. So in, in between meals, if you give milkshakes, that also adds to the caloric intake, you know, increases your calories. They're tasty. You can put all kinds of things in smoothies. You can make them at, at home. Some people buy Ensure and other nutritional, you know, liquid supplements. It's not always necessary to do that if you can make healthy smoothies, even with a scoop of protein powder, with an egg, you know, uh, so you can actually make very nutritious meals and snacks. Some people in advanced stages just want liquids. So a smoothie can be a great meal if you add, you know, the protein. The other thing that uh, helps is finger food. So mm. patients with dementia might not have the dexterity and the patients use a knife and fork and or the food might can be cut up for them. So don't make it complicated. Don't make it too fancy. Appearance is important, very important. Color is important. Okay, um, but finger foods seem to go well. Patients like that. They have some autonomy and enjoyment. And you need to have patience when uh, you're supervising or helping a, an older adult with uh, meals. You need to have time. If you rush a meal, uh, they won't get enough to eat. Wow! Wow! That, that's really good. Um, and that makes sense. It's I, I hear less is best. Less is best. Keep it light. Keep it fun. Keep it interesting. Yes. Um, don't mm -hmm. overcomplicate it for the person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Uh, let's it's see. Like we have another one. It's yeah. a bit like, you know, right? Some music, some chit chat, a little bit of distraction. Yeah. It uh, helps them to eat more. And so uh, yeah. I think music, conversation, socialization okay. is important for all the yes. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. That's really good. Um, the other one says, if I already have diabetes, can I still lessen my risk for dementia? If so, In how? Very important, and that is a great question because um, I'll just kind of set the stage, you know, to our initial uh, discussions with this session uh, and why I thought it was important. We know that people with type 2 diabetes do have a global decline in cognition. They're almost twice as likely to have cognitive problems, dementia. It can be Alzheimer's disease, but it can be vascular dementia due to circulation problems, strokes, mini mm -hmm. strokes. And um, so, yes, you have the disease. You can uh, work with your provider, your physician, your practitioner to make sure that your blood sugars aren't too low. All right. So because right. as I said, hypoglycemia and repeated episodes of hypoglycemia can damage, you know, uh, can uh, damage the brain, to put it very basically, and uh, impair cognition. It can affect, you know, uh, your memory for events, your memory for facts and figures, and it can mm -hmm. even affect your executive function, you know. But at the same time, overly uh, high blood glucose levels, poorly controlled diabetes is also associated with dementia, okay, twice the, the mm -hmm. risk. So you cannot be too low and you cannot be too high. And the goal, what is the appropriate goal for each individual? And that has to be decided with the practitioner, hopefully following some yeah. of the guidelines that are available. So very high blood sugars over a period of time can affect you and very low blood sugars. 
So it all, and at the same time, not only glucose control, but blood pressure control, cholesterol control, monitoring kidney function, all those things will affect cognition. I see. I see. And it's, I, it's balance. I hear violent. And I always have a friend who says, you know, balance is hard to attain. So what you're trying to find is harmony in everything. So, yes. um, but I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not too much, not too less. It's finding what works for that patient, work for that individual and make sure that you, you do these things. Um, Alexa, do you have any more questions from the audience? I'm sorry, doctor. No, no problem. Happy to answer any more questions. Okay. I think we're okay. okay. Wonderful. Um, what I wanted if there to say, someone... well, sorry, Barbara. What I wanted to say uh, is that um, you know, goals of diabetes management can be individualized. Every uh, and this is in discussion with your practitioner. And it can also, you know, you need to have your say. Like, you can say, well, I'm not ready to go on three shots of insulin. Is there something else? And there are treatments now that might make treatment, make it easier to manage people with diabetes. Um, I'm tired of doing finger sticks. And we have continuous glucose monitors now um, that uh, can... Uh, you know, obviate the need for doing finger sticks. So those are approved for people, you know, who have diabetes, who are doing frequent uh, three or more shots of insulin. They might be on an insulin pump. Uh, they, you might need to adjust their insulin uh, and other medication treatments frequently because they're not well controlled. And they need to see their doctor on a regular basis. So for those people, these continuous glucose monitors are approved, which can really change the you know your life if you think about all the multiple finger sticks that you have to do and the discomfort and also it tells you at any time of the day or night what your blood sugar is it can be set up to alarm mm. if you're asleep and if your blood sugar is too low it'll wake you up or if you you, you know if you've had an excess of carbohydrates at a, a big dinner you'll know how high your blood sugar is and so the right. low and yeah. high alarm the set it gives you feedback and it's really been shown that people change their lifestyle in response to all this information they're getting all mm. the time about their blood sugar and even family members can carry the apps on their phone so even if their loved one is at home they know what's happening to their blood sugars if they're alone mm. exactly and it's 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 almost become it's it's teamwork it's actually teamwork at that teamwork. point um, yeah, to make sure that person is well. Okay, anything else? If there was one thing you would like to leave us with, the audience with, what would that one thing be at this time? I think my um, main recommendation would be to individualize the treatment, uh, all the medications and the lifestyle treatment to suit that person and to simplify the treatment. That will be my main recommendation. Don't make it too complicated, but maybe too many shots, too many medications, too many glucose checks, if you can manage it without doing that. And now we have technology to help us. Wow, wow. And, and I think what you just said is so applicable um, make it manageable, make it with, mm -hmm. in, 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 customize it, customize it. If you find Definitely, a yes. system, right, customize it, find Absolutely. this system, of course, with the um, doctor's input, nothing too much, nothing too less. But if you see that it's working, it's stabilizing the individual, it's, um, it's easy for everyone. It's doable and not it never easy, but it's doable for everyone. And as they say, make it make sense. Make it make sense. So yeah. I, I think that's yeah, yeah, that's a, and that that seems so applicable to me. So thank you so much once again. Um, this knowledge, I, I just I just think we're lucky that we can have someone like you in our community who can disseminate this type of information in a very relatable manner. So thank you once again, 
Dr. Pandia. Thank you for joining us. And please stay safe. Please stay safe. Thank you. You're so welcome. And it was a great pleasure. Thank you. All righty. All the best. All righty, all righty. Thank you once again. Brain Info Live here in Florida, our 12th session. Barbara Chandler, I'm Barbara Chandler. That was Dr. Noshira Pandia. And she spoke to us and you heard the wrap up. It's dementia and dementia and diabetes and the relationship. And the one thing she left us with, and it's just been so consistent, if you go back through our 12 sessions, maybe excluding driving, one of the things, and finance, maybe excluding driving and finance, one of the things that they speak about diet and exercise, finding that harmonious balance for that person that is living with dementia, as well as any other um, illnesses that may be diagnosed, find what works. Keep it simple. Keep it simple for not only the caregiver, but the person that, that, that you're caring for through diet, through nutrition. We talked about the smoothies, talked about the smart snacks, just finding something that works, um, not too much, not too less, but right where, right in the middle, right in the middle that it's able to sustain. It's able to sustain, it's able to be managed, and the person also gets to be included in that wellness plan. So we always want to thank Dr. Pandia. This is her second time um, speaking with the Brain Info Live audience, and she's just a wealth of information. We're going to move on. Let's see what we have. We have our poll. As usual, we have a poll, okay? This is how we test ourselves. This is our self-test. And we're gonna bring up the poll really quick. There it is. If you live with dementia and diabetes, you must have a very strict, healthy diet. Okay, true or false? If you live with dementia and diabetes, if you're caring for someone with dementia and diabetes, they must have a very strict, healthy diet. All right, and the answer is, I never do a good drum roll. The answer is false, and we heard that today. Again, I think our takeaway word today is balance. We have to find the balance. We don't want to take away um, and or feel deprived. I think that's the word. When you take away everything, you start to feel deprived. And when a person starts to feel deprived, they want it even more. So we want to find the healthy, we want to find a healthy diet. We want to find a healthy lifestyle. She talked about the smoothies, uh, making smoothies on your own with the things you have in your home already. Finger foods. I love finger foods, um, whether it's chips. And she also talked about socializing during um, mealtime, whether it's with music, conversation, chit chat. Those are things we can do. Those are things that we are already doing. Okay. I love the finger foods. There's the carrots. There's the little um, peanuts. Of course, it, let's not um, do peanuts if anybody has a peanut allergy. But again, these small grapes, grapes are always fun to eat. Okay, so we, we, we want to find the balance. That is the takeaway word for this section. This session is finding the balance, not too much, not too less, but we're finding what works and what we can maintain. All righty. So guess what? It is time to talk about our resources. I believe in resources. If you know me, if you know me, I believe in having resources handy. You never know when you're going to need them for yourself. You never know when you're going to need them for a neighbor, uh, a loved one. So resources, we want to introduce some of our national and local resources when we're speaking about diabetes and dementia. All right. We have national on the national level, Harvard Health Publishing. What's the relationship between diabetes and dementia? We also have AARP. AARP is a long-standing organization within our communities. 
Um, seven steps to take after diabetes is diagnosed. Over medication of diabetes can cause health problems. The surprising link between diabetes and hearing loss. Check out the AARP for more information on that. Advent Health Orlando, very familiar with Advent Health. That's a Florida resource. Caring for diabetes and unique check. I can't see the other word, but I do see where it says caring for diabetes and then unique challenge. Once again, these are the resources, okay? Caring for diabetes and dementia, thank you. A unique challenge. Thank you so much, Alexis. All righty. If you have not signed up with us, always, always, this is a perfect time in which to do so, in which you can continue. There it is right there. Continue to receive information from us. Join the Brain Info Live mailing list. This is where you can add to your uh, repository of, of resources, okay? If you have information um, or if you would like information, this is where you can sign up. All right, bit.ly forward slash bil sign up. This is where you can sign up with us. All righty. Once again, we want to thank everyone, every single one who's been here with us. Again, for those of you, we are in Florida right now. Hurricane Ian is approaching, depending on where you are. I know it's covering a lot of territory. We want our caregivers to be safe. We want our families to be safe. We want the people and the loved ones who we're taking care of to be safe as well. Uh, by now, everyone should have their necessary supplies. Everyone should have a list of places. If you have to evacuate, I know that you have a plan in place. I know you have a plan in place. I'm confident that you have a plan in place in case you and your loved ones have to evacuate. All right. Um, we just want to thank you. We want to thank Dr. Nushira Pandia. And we also want to thank our fitness guru, John Lewis, AKA J Lou. We also want to thank the Brain Info team for all the work that they're doing and making sure that they bring us some of the top professionals in the industry that can share this valuable information with us. We want to thank the people in the background for making this video so wonderful. Um, and for most, most of all, we want to thank you, those who are watching us. And um, we certainly appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you again. Until then, we say stay safe. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.